welcome everyone. It's such a pleasure to see you all here today and also to be with so many phenomenal people I was able to speak with um, throughout this project. You are here for Rethinking Signal Flow, Gender, Audio Education and Professional Development in the Recording Arts in Canada. I will be hosting the panel alongside, obviously, Dr. Amandine Pross. Um, we're the co-authors on this study and we have just an incredible group of recordists, educators, pedagogues, and just industry powerhouses. Margaret, I'm looking at you, which you can't tell right now. Um, so we are very excited to present for the first time our research that we, we started in the summer um, of 2021. So let's jump right in for our session plan. So we're gonna start off with a conceptual introduction. I'm sure many of you saw signal flow and was like, why are we talking about audio direction and gender and audio production um, and education? So we're gonna get into that a little bit. I'm not just going to assume that everyone's on the pa same page with what we're discussing there. Then we're gonna look at some of the studies and statistics, the big important question of academic research. Why are we doing this? Why does this matter? Um, and so from there, we're going to talk more about our research and our goals. And then I have a lovely chart. It's not lovely. It's okay. Um, where we're going to get the chance to meet the panelists. So all of the wonder, wonderful folks that have been, just been doing incredible work in the industry um, and doing specific, a lot of, specifically a lot of work in education and pedagogy, which is our focus of the study. And then we'll have panel discussion and then we'll switch to a Q&A. So you might be wondering, why is there a car audio stereo system signal flow from the dummies website, right? Car audio for dummies website of all things on here. Well, when we think about signal flow, and we're going to be thinking about signal flow, maybe not in the technical terms, but in the conceptual or metaphorical terms, we're really talking about a lot of different things. So I think it's important to clarify um, what we mean when we talk about signal flow, specifically looking at audio education in Canada. So this is another lovely diagram um, that I have found on the internet. Um, that was an introductory lesson to signal flow, which I found quite effective and interesting. So let's think a little bit more about what these terms and what this term means. So signal flow or signal processing is really describing the direction of sound, the direction of electricity, the direction of waves. So how, travel, uh, how sound travels from the beginning to the end of its audio path. And so I really like this idea of paths because it helps to think through careers and opportunities and um, directions, and really importantly for our research, blockages and restrictions. So really there are multiple uses of signal flow in terms of the rhetorical and terminological use today, right? We can talk about car audio. We can talk about instrument design. Psychoanalysts use this type of terminology to discuss the processes of human hearing, um, but it's also commonly for engineers and producers used to discuss studio organization. And we're gonna use it in a more metaphorical sense in this presentation. And it helps us to understand better what's going on technically as well as socially within a studio context. So of course, here we can have signal flow as a tool, right? As a problem solving tool, but we can also think of signal flow as a metaphor, which is really what we're gonna be thinking through and talking about today, or what I hope we're gonna be thinking through. Um, and of course, this is not new or novel language generally when we think about what is required of contemporary recordists, right? So in the engineering and technical sense, sorry, this language really came into being in the 1920s. So this has long been used um, just in colloquial speech. So in our research, it's really useful to describe the particular flow, right? The particular movement between learning and professionalization between education and employment, and importantly, in thinking about sustainable equity within the field. And I really, throughout this presentation, want to emphasize sustainability. So how do we support early and mid-career recordists, women and gender non-conforming recordists, BIPOC recordists, you know, poor recordists, disabled recordists, to have sustainable and long-term careers, and actually begin to structurally change the overall 
structure, yes, but also the institutions that make up the recording industries in Canada and the education. And so to get a picture of why this matters, we can begin to think about the Annenberg Research Institute study that was published in 2018, 2019, conducted by Dr. Stacy Smith. And this was incredibly comprehensive in terms of scale and also in terms of detail compared to what was available before, which was frankly not that much. Um, and so they looked at a lot of different factors. And we're just going to talk a bit about the statistics for production specifically today, obviously, because that's our focus, gender and record production. So in terms of the data that they worked with for production, they were looking at roughly 300 songs over the course of excuse me, of three years or so. And so what they found is that approximately 651 producers were credited. So what do I mean by producers? So they looked at producers, they looked at co-producers, and they looked at vocal producers specifically for these statistics. So these are not including um, the engineers necessarily, or the assistants, um, or the, even the executive producers. So that's important to note in terms of the sample the sample um, representation. And so how they found this, this data is they looked at liner notes and they also looked at the online credits listed. And so of course, many of you who've been in the industry for a while know these can be notoriously inaccurate. So this is also something that has to be taken into account when thinking about the presentation of this data. But I think what really is striking about this research was again, this kind of hovering around 2%, right? So we have this ratio of 98% male dominated male producers who are the top charting producers, right? Quote unquote, um, in the United States. And then of these producers, 2% are women. And again, this study doesn't even begin to contend with the nuances of gender. Um, which was likely intentional in terms of the scale and size of the study, but it is something that doesn't give us the entire picture, but it gives us a pretty striking picture of what's happening, at least at the highest professional popular um, production levels, which I think is quite useful. So again, this, this question, why does this matter? Why is this important? Well, this means that there's approximately a ratio of 49 to one in terms of participation. Um, in the popular songs connect, collected in this very distinct period. Um, and so, again, we have to think about this in terms of what does this mean? Why does this matter? Well, when we're also thinking about intersections, right, intersections of identity, we're not single issue human beings, right? Gender is not the singular issue in terms of understanding ways to promote and create better equity within the field. So they also found that of the 651 total producers, right, on the 300 songs over the course of three years, only two were women of color. So that's pretty shocking as well in terms of orientating the industry to indicate, again, a very particular body that's represented in the idea, quote unquote, of music producer and music production. And this, of course, is emphasized by the fact that women are generally more likely just not to be credited for their work. Um, and I found specifically the, the statistics around race and ethnicity with this study really um, surprising, perhaps. I think because considering the history of popular music in North America um, that has, again, relied so heavily on women of colors musical practices, production, um, innovation, and so on, that again, that only two producers have, have contributed to the top charting hits was quite surprising. So what does this look like in terms of the Canadian scene? Well, we don't actually have comprehensive numbers. So this is, this is an area that definitely needs development and further attention. Um, but we do have a very limited study to work with, which is what I'm looking, what we're looking at now. And really it does parallel a lot of what the Annenberg research study found, quite frankly. So this was carried out in 2014. It was organized by Women in Music Canada, which is quite a large um, organization for those of you who may not be familiar with their work. 
But this study was focused on Ontario, on the province of Ontario's music makers. And again, it was not focused specifically on music production and engineering. It was really an overview. But this is, this is also interesting and useful information for qualitative researchers like myself to have. Um, so again, here, music production was um, defined in a slightly different way than the Annenberg research um, study. So this one for music production, what does it include? It includes music production, recording, live sound, but it also includes music publishing, which I found an interesting coupling. Um, and also will again, tend to skew the numbers a bit higher, I think, than they might be if we just, just focus on production and engineering roles. So what this emphasizes too, like its Annenberg counterpart, is that women are largely absent from the text fields. It also, um, if you could go through the whole document, it suggests that, again, we're looking at a mostly white, mostly affluent, most of the, um, the respondents of the 395 participants um, had some form of post-secondary education. So again, this is delimiting identity, the identity of the producer in a very particular way that tends to reproduce certain types of relationalities in the professional world, in the studio, and so on. Um, so again, two, one, one, I guess, caveat of thinking about this study in terms of the Canadian scene is Ontario is quite idealistic, I would say, compared to other provinces and other localities. Right, a lot of the a lot of the industry is concentrated specifically in Toronto. So, if there was a national study, um, I wonder how this number, how this six percent, right, six percent of respondents of three hundred ninety five respondents, um, I wonder what the statistics would look like um, in that case. And we don't know. We actually just don't have those numbers available at this point. Um, and again, two one thing that I would like to see in in future quantitative studies looking at disparity in the industry is more of a recogn recognition and moving beyond the binary, right? Again, this is very much delimited by women, men, um, but of course, gender is fluid and on a spectrum and again, needs to be considered in its totality. I think if we're gonna actually create substantial change and sustainability. So, Quantitative studies are really useful, right, for telling us particularities or irregularities or certain, certain dynamics that are, that are statistically significant. But it still doesn't quite get at why is this important? Why does this matter? And so that's where Amandine and my research begins to fill the gap. And a lot of research actually that has been, that has happened in the last 10 years or so has begun to fill this gap and to, to extend this discussion in really productive and interesting ways. And there we go. So there are of course many studies, not many, but a handful of studies that have begun to, to think through and think about the materialities of being a recordist. So what I mean by materialities here, because this is quite specific language, is really what that 2%, or let's say what that 2 to 6% actually feels like for people working in the field. And so this is something that has been developed and is continually being developed by many of my colleagues in the room, right, and in the Zoom. So of course we have Brooks's recent study and Amandine's recent study that was just, just, just published in 2021. But this is something that has a lineage. So Frith and McRobbie began discussing how the production industry specifically are male dominated back in 1978. So this has always been something noted within academic research, but it hasn't really been focused until more recently. Um, and Heather Kirby, I forgot to put Heather Kirby's dissertation, which was published in 2013. I can't see your face. Do that okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh. My, my um, source memorization is still somewhat, somewhat decent at this point. Um, so yeah, there, there is work that is, again, beginning to attend to the, the particularities of being a recordist and living with this, this statistical disparity, right? And of course, this, for those of you who do not know me, this is really the focus of my dissertation, which is forthcoming, um, which looks at this idea of the hums 
um, which really attempts to materialize the affective registers and the nuances of being and living as, as a person made marginal to the record production industries. And I say made marginal because uh, I don't think anyone is marginal, right? But there are different processes that enable and allow um, people to feel unwelcome, unsupported, unsafe, and so on. And these need to be, these issues obviously need to be addressed. So, I mean, what does this mean? And what did this, this kind of present as in terms of, of the significance and the importance of this type of research. So, I mean, I have lots of recounts in my, in my dissertation, as well as in our discussion that emphasized um, feelings of isolation, of exclusion, of tokenism, of low self-esteem, of a general lack of access to technical knowledge and skills, a lack of financial stability or a lack of access to financial um, reparation, increased risk of discrimination, harassment, and assault, intense micro, microaggressions, uh, the expectation of invisible labor on top of, on top of the regular labor of being a recordist, um, and just being less likely to receive award nominations and recognition at kind of every level of the game if we want to consider the industry within those terms. Um, as well as other challenges, right? Thinking through personal lives, thinking through motherhood or parenthood, right? In, in, in this, this dynamic in this particular field is often very difficult and something that was voiced as being challenging for many. So these are, these are all factors that actually get at what it means and why this matters to do this type of work and this type of research. So thankfully, right, at this point, we do have many um, programs and workshops and courses that are invested in beginning to address these issues and just allowing people to have better, uh, I will say better, um, working conditions and educational conditions and so on to create these sustainable careers. But of course, all the inclusive audio education programs and initiatives will not change um, the long-term participation or safety if the systems and the institution and the people that make up the industry do not change as well. So this really, this happens obviously individual, individually, but really at a collective level, which I think is is amazing. We, we are so powerful to create better working conditions actually for everyone. Um, and again, some people say, you know, you just focus on, on women and gender nonconforming and trans and non-binary recordists, like what about men? And I have to tell you that quite frankly, in my dissertation research, some of the behaviors that many young um, male assistants faced um, that were, that were obviously told to me secondhand by by their colleagues and by even friends, the hazing and the bullying that that can persist is is shocking and horrifying and is something that should have zero tolerance at this point in time, right? We we all know better. Um, so these these types of things um, are all to be addressed um, and are slowly being addressed at a broader level, which is really exciting. So of course, this is when. This is, I guess, where Amadine um, and I come in. And so this was a very small scale study that was focused specifically on Canada-based programs that have been developed to enhance equity um, music in music production and engineering. Um, and the goal is really to examine solutions with the programs, expertise, organizations, and facilities already in place because there are incredible programs in place to enhance women and gender non-conforming um, producers access to advanced audio education in Canada. So our study begins to look at, at these issues that need to be addressed um, institutionally and industry-wide. And this is um, gratefully the first opportunity for us to begin to present this publicly and also having a free public forum to be able to do so is quite wonderful and rare. So thank you to the University of Victoria and to Kirk um, for, and to Amandine, obviously, for all of your organizational efforts to put this together. It's really, really cool and novel. 
So again, we're attempting to address deeper issues here. We know that there's a problem. Statistically, we've seen that there's this ongoing problem and many studies have begun to contextualize the materiality of this issue. Um, so we're looking and pushing to understand what needs to happen beyond the level of just increasing rep uh, representation in the field. So we will get to that more obviously when we, when we begin talking to everyone because y'all are the experts. But for now, I'll do a very, very brief meet the panelists um, chart. Actually, it's a lovely chart. So <laughs> it doesn't have all of the information, but I think it's all right, given my, my limited skills. So what I've attempted to do here somewhat successfully, I would say, is to just organize and also so show some of the affiliations and connections between many of the people who were participants in this study. So we have first the lovely Margaret McGuffin, um, the Chief Executive Officer of the Music Publishers Association of Canada based in Toronto. Um, and so really she was the force behind the women in the studio program. And I know you will not take credit for that. I can't see you right now, but I am crediting for you for that because I know that was something that you really wanted to, to promote and develop in, in whatever capacity you can. And you found a way to do that, which was really phenomenal. So again, in terms of who, is, who this program is for, who this program addresses, it's really focused on women identified producers um, and songwriters. So it's niche in that sense, which is, really useful and interesting. Next, we have our incredible keynote, Annalise Narona, um, who's an engineer, producer, songwriter, artist, extraordinaire, essentially, um, who has worked, obviously, as an educator at the Harris Institute, has worked independently, has been a mentor for Resampled, um, was quite active in the Hearst Studio Mentorship, of which I was also a part. That's Lisa Patterson's um, just incredible grassroots program. And from what I found from the internet and from our discussion, um, you, you taught Pro Tools, which is obviously really important in terms of technical fluency in, in the classroom um, and in the industry. And of course, it, your, your audience varied depending on the forum um, from focused um, gender segregated groups to mixed audiences, which is great. So Heather Kirby, um, obviously a scholar, instructor, engineer, sound editor, who teaches at the RTA School of Media and also owns and runs Dreamlands Mastering based in Prince Edward County, Ontario. And again, your, your disser dissertation, sorry, your master's research focused on the development of the resampled workshop. And I'm gonna give everyone a chance to kind of introduce their, their pedagogical programs and approaches in a second, but also, you develop programming specific for women and trans producers and have also worked with mixed, um, mixed gender students. Um, Kai has done incredible work as a scholar, sound engineer and artist at McGill, of course, a fellow doctoral candidate, um, as well as, as a large contributor to La Ponte in Montreal, Quebec. And so again, you've worked a lot with mentorship, audio education research, and your, and your doctoral work, if I remember correctly, is dealing with masculinities, which I love. Oh, I can't wait to read this when it's finished. I say that to all my friends, but really, I can't wait to read that, your work. Um, and Marcella, congratulations, recent appointment to the University of Lethbridge as the instructor of music production and audio engineering. You've done sound engineering, content development. You've volunteered with She Knows Tech based in Lethbridge, Alberta right now. And of course, last but not least, we have Dr. Amandine Pross, professor, engineer, producer, um, based at University of York in York, England, not York University, which is a different ordering of words. Again, sound matters and organization matters, both important to engineering roles as well as linguistic work. So again, you've, you've done lecturing on sound production and music recording. You've been a consultant for Margaret's Women in the Studio uh, program. You've done tons of work on audio, audio education research, which is just so important to continue to develop and have catered again to, to the groups and the audiences and the students that you've worked with. So this is, this is quite an eclectic group, um, but also a quite specialized group in terms of 
the individual, um, I guess, qualities that we have to offer, but also the collaborative work that is already being done, that has been done, that continues to be done within this community of scholars and recordists, which is really exciting and engaging for me. So on that note, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen because I've blabbered on for far too long by this point. So for the first question, because I always love an icebreaker before we get into it, please share your name, your pronouns, what you like most about your work or a project that you've worked on that you really, really loved and has been incredibly rewarding and why. I'm gonna go left to right. Let's start with Annalise. I'm Annalise Nerona. My pronouns are she, her, um, and I am the least academic of this group. So you know, those are both really hard questions to answer what you like most about your work. So maybe I'll go with the project one. Back in the old days, it was when you would turn off the, the large tape machines because then all the fans would stop and you'd finally have silence after a day of work. So, but now we can't really say that because it's not nearly as loud. So I'm trying to think of an actual project that might be something to call out. Um, and probably, uh, even though I was just an assistant engineer on it, and we'll, we'll probably touch on this in the keynote later, but um, I got to work with uh, James Brown and his band for three days, and it was like, he's a living legend, right? So, so everything about it is etched into my memory so clearly. Um, so that would probably be my most best memory of the session anyways. Um, wow. <laughs> did I go next? Yeah. I guess the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Kai Brooks. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. And my, my most preferred recent memory uh, at work is that I, I was able to go with um, an artist who I've worked with uh, quite a bit in the last couple of years, uh, Eve Parker Finley, who's also a very funny TikTok comedian, if people are on TikTok. Um, but we we got to go to the Phi North residency um, just uh, north of Montreal for two weeks um, to to record another album. And um, it was a lovely studio. And also it was really just an incredibly beautiful place. Um, so really nice working vacation. <laughs> Cool. Uh, well, my name is Marcella Rada. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm going to talk about my favorite thing, I guess, about my job. <laughs> I think uh, what I love the most is to be able to inspire as an educator and as a mentor. Um, I have been able to inspire projects, careers, innovation and that is very very rewarding <laughs> okay it's my my name okay so uh, my name is Amandine Pra and my pronouns are her are she and her um so I think what I prefer about the job of being an audio engineer is mixing on the fly on a big analog console desk I really have the choice on an EVE 8088 or something like that um but uh, yeah, I did some great projects on this Neve, but I guess my favorite project of all time was when I, I got to pay myself um, to direct a movie in India with four great musicians who were Jim Black, Michael Atias, Shubha Jyotigo, and Shubhato Roshudri. And this was a great fantasy to bring together two musical genres that I really love, which is free jazz on one side, um, Hindustani classical music, and to create a movie from scratch with these musicians. And um, what I didn't expect is when I did present the movie and the World Film Festival in Montreal is the way I got treated. And I realized once more that there's a problem with audio engineering. And it was just really, really positive to be at once in a festival with a tag being just saying film director. And the, the look of people, the conversations. Uh, I even got two dates in like one, two minutes. <laughs> so that was the thing. I thought that was like interesting. So I didn't know about that before doing this festival. But anyway, that, that has stick with me. So I'm looking forward for my next movie. Yeah. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Margaret. I'm Margaret McGuffin. My pronouns are she, her. And 
I love my job right now. It's great because I get to choose what I want to do. And uh, uh, most times nobody gets to say no now. So that's <laughs> a, a great position to be in. Um, I love music, but I also am a political junk junkie. So my job is perfect right now. So I get to go to talk to politicians on a daily basis and tell them about what you do and and why songwriters, composers, and music publishers need to get paid. So um, that's a great privilege and it's um, a lot of fun and it's important. So I love that. The most important, thinking about sustainability, people need to be paid for their work, you know. Heather. Hi, um, thanks for having me here, Allison and Amandine. Um, yeah, I'm Heather Kirby and my pronouns are she, her. Um, and I'd say a recent memorable fun project, recording project anyways, was uh, with the band Austra for their last record that they put out. And um, it was really neat because Katie, um, the kind of lead in Austra, was really interested in bringing in a range of musicians to come in and improvise. Um, and we were working in a beautiful space called Union Sound in Toronto, a beautiful room. And it was cool because the, the musicians she brought in to improvise were playing a lot of instruments I'd never recorded before. Um, and it was, you know, there was a children's choir, there was the band Pentayo came in and they they use a lot of kind of traditional Philippinex per, percussion instruments. Um, and uh, the band Camoncello came in too um, with some interesting instruments. And it was just this really cool experience of getting to go into this room and just listening and hearing what these instruments were doing and the sound they were making and trying to brainstorm how to capture them without ever having experience with those particular scenarios. So it was a fun, challenging and uh, rewarding experience for me. So, yeah. That's fantastic. I actually met with Penteo over the summer to talk oh. about their work and I was like, how is this so cool? You know, I love Filipino gong music. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. So thank you, everyone. Welcome to everyone in the audience. Um, we obviously have a lot of incredible things to discuss and people involved in this discussion today. So because all of you have had some form of formal training and because we have many students in the room who are just starting out, I was wondering if you would be willing to describe your early educational experience and the most valuable things you learned and what did you need more of as a young student or what you felt you needed more of as a young student? I went to Fanshawe College as my formal education, not a university, but at the time there wasn't much else. Um, and I graduated in 1993 of the engineering class of 66 students, there were six women. Um, and I mean, 1993, you were all born after 1993, I'm pretty sure. No, not you, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, at that time, uh, much like in my career, we never had the focus on, on, the, on any sort of gender disparities or so basically what happens is the way that you survive is to be one of one of the boys and try to fit in and slip under the radar and not do anything. I had a few really great teachers and I had a few te teachers who really did not think that I would make it through, you know? In a very rudimentary way, the year that I went to Fanshawe College, they had dropped electronics from the from the course, and and that I would have loved to have had some basic electronics, electricity, and electronics training. Um, they just focused up more on being a user, you know. Um, so I would have loved to have more of that. The most valuable thing I learned in school is that uh, if you're of a general smartness, anyone can learn how to do what we do. So, so the things that make you better are the way that you interact with people, the way that you network, the way that you hustle more. Um, the studio, we'd have our education, they had two studios and they would run 24 hours a day and every student would have three hour blocks. And so, because everyone's a musician, they're all recording their own stuff and I, 
swear that the reason why I did well there is because I just hustled everyone and tried to be everyone's engineer. Obviously, you have to get your chops up and be good at something like that you're doing, but but um, just being able to know that the time matters, like putting in the time, it matters. So that would probably be the thing that I learned and right from the get-go. It's not just about what you're learning, it's about like putting in the time, uh, making, building those relationships. Um, I don't actually have a formal audio education. I did my undergrad and master's in uh, applied math and biology. Um, <laughs> but then I started a DIY venue with some friends uh, right out of undergrad. And so started doing live sound in that context. So I have a lot of, um, I really just uh, was with a group of friends and we taught, taught each other. But I've had uh, a number of really uh, important and lovely mentors um, who have worked with me in the, I guess, 10 years since that, that happened. Um, and I think that there's maybe two things that I would say are the most important things that I've learned. One, which is, again, exactly this thing of uh, learning how to deal with people and um, how to uh, make them feel confident uh, in you and in themselves. Um, and then I think the other thing that I would bring up would be just being really, really rigorous with your meta metadata, like keeping a lot of like careful notes on what you've done, what you're in the middle of doing. Um, like just, I have like a folder full of all my patches from the last like n years, just like that because I write them all down. And I think like that can save you and the people who are dealing with your sessions later a lot of trouble. So I feel like that's maybe something that I. And was there something that you wanted to learn more about when you were starting out or you wanted perhaps more access to? Yeah, I mean, when I was starting out, it was really very much in this like DIY venue uh, context of like just figuring things out. I feel like, um, oh my gosh, it's a really difficult question. <laughs> uh, I guess it would have been, no, I really actually can't think of anything right now. I feel like it's, it's a, I mean, I guess like there's lots of things that, that, that I could have wanted to learn more about, but they were, it was just a, in a context where if you wanted to learn about it, you just figured out how to learn about it. So, yeah. Great. Thank you, Marcella. Um, okay. So my educational background starts with a music industry arts diploma from Algonquin College. Then I did a Bachelor of Music with a major in digital audio arts from the University of Lethbridge. Um, I have a master's degree from Berklee College of Music and Music Production Technology and Innovation, as well as a postmaster's um, fellowship in academic technology um, from Berkeley as well. Um, so what I found the most valuable, I guess one of the things that I value the most about uh, my education is that it made me a go-getter. Um, I learned that it doesn't matter what school you go to, if you don't find the opportunities to grow and learn, like if you don't seek for them on your own, no one is gonna give them to you in a servo platter. So um, I saw the difference between those of us who worked really hard at school and found those opportunities and make those connections and those who just focus on complaining because they weren't getting enough. So um, <laughs> it happens at every school. And I mean, I've been to quite a few schools. So <laughs> it happens at every school. But what I learned is that if I wanted to learn from someone, if I wanted to make a connection, if I wanted to be invited to a conference, if I, I could make that happen for myself. And um, I mean, my, my career has fast tracked exponentially because of that, really. I, I am a university instructor at this point in my career, and I am um, known internationally. I have spoken at international conferences. Um, and so I've done quite a few things. Um, and I'm not going to say I did them alone. Of course not. There's always people that are there to help and collaborate with. Um, but but I've made a lot of stuff happen for myself. Um, and so I think, yeah, I, school, schools give you, you know, tools and mentors like us, but uh, really it's about what you want to get out of it and how much effort you want to put into it. And if you're going to put in the work and um, I 
never slept, <laughs> to be honest. I barely slept when I was in my master's, uh, but worth it, you know. Um, so that's what I found the most valuable. And when it comes to something that I wish I would have learned more of, um, I think I agree with you, Annalise, that I would have liked to learn more about electronics and building, you know, because part of being called a sound engineer is that actually you can build stuff, yeah. you know, and so um, I, I would have liked to maybe learn more of that, although, like you said, if you wanted to learn about something, you could also uh, try and focus on that. That wasn't really one of my main focuses, but maybe I, if, if I had the time, I would go into that a bit more. Lovely, I'm wondering. Okay, so I started uh, doing audio as a live engineer in my high school, because uh, I was playing the piano, Classic. I was classically trained, and but I was really into pop music and all the bands were starting and I started playing keyboards, but I hated the sound. So I thought, well, I guess I'm gonna be the live engineer. So that's how it started. And um, then I decided to go in the Paris Conservatoire, which was a graduate program. There were no undergraduates program in the public system in France at the time. There were a few private schools, but that was not gonna be an option. And so I did a physics degree to be able to get in the competition, to get in the Tom Meister program, the Paris Conservatoire. At the time it was okay, I liked it. I don't know, I changed a lot, but at the time I enjoyed math and physics quite a lot. Uh, so I did a lot of electronics, a lot of acoustics, a lot of computer science. The computer science part I hated it, though, I should say, from the very beginning. But everything else was fine, and I was taking a lot of music classes on the evening. And, and, uh, and I did also an audio technician degree uh, that was going with an internship, like a kind of a regular internship in live engineering. Uh, and it was pretty good uh, because I was doing a lot of world music, jazz, like African music, like it was in the suburbs of Paris and it was quite great. And then I got in the Tom Meister program. So this was four years of graduate program. Uh, we didn't pay anything, but they used us like to work for free days and nights, weekend included, uh, to get the best possible education in audio engineering and music production that you could even dream of. But at the time, um, I mean, I got through a lot of psychological issues and we were only two women in the program when I got in and the two of us at exactly the same time had to go into psychiatry stuff and whatever. It took me about 10 years to realize that that was probably not a coincidence and that that was probably also because of the school, which none of us had understood at the time. Uh, so if I think about, yeah, what I, I, I hope they would have taught us at the time is yeah, to be aware of what was going on because they were teaching us very well how to deal with the most crazy musicians and how to, how to you know, basically interact, get the gigs and all of that. But I didn't realize at the time how disturbing that could be. And so anyway, so that's something that I have to try to change when I start teaching. Um, yeah, and that, I guess that's it. I mean, I should mention I went to the band center. That was also a very important part of my Former education that was after my graduate school. I worked for a year in France and then I moved to Canada and I spent one year at the BAM Center. And that was that was really good because for once I was not judged and I could work on my own um, days and nights without any kind of commercial thing. Because even at the Paris Conservatoire, we had to fulfill like the client's desires all the time. So that was a very good experience. And as some people here are aware, right? Uh, we hope the program is going to reopen soon and that some of you can go. But yeah, I do recommend that program a lot. So yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Margaret. So I don't come with a creative or a technical background. Uh, my um, love in high school was political science. I could, I calculated the electoral presidential uh, vote in the U.S. when I was in grade 10, and I, I won my class bet because I loved that stuff. Um, and, um, you know, I always loved music. I always took art classes and uh, ended up at Western um, studying political science, but also um, stage managing. I wanted to become a professional stage manager. manager. I applied to BAMP. Um, and then, but also studied photography at the same time as studying political science. And um, when I was graduating, I had the great honor of working with um, the technical team from Shaw Festival, 
on a couple uh, on a production at Western, and I was quite sure I wanted to become a stage manager. And um, one of them said, "Well, there's a great MBA program at York, which is now the Schulich MBA. Um, it's one of the first arts and media programs in in North America. Um, it's been running from the early '70s, and I, I went there, and it it was the perfect choice because I could continue my love of policy." Well, studying um, marketing and and not for profit uh, governance, and I've become a bit of a governance geek. I've um, gone to Rotman and taken their professional development courses on um, on governance. I was have been involved in boards um, from my early twenties till now. I'm right now I'm the chair of work and culture. I love um, not for profit governance and. Um, and I know that doesn't connect, but it does. It, it So right now, it's brought me to what I think is my perfect job as CEO of Music Publishers Canada. And um, I think what I learned is there's no direct route. You never know where you're going to be in 30 years. And uh, you need to take advantage of opportunities and connections you make along the way. Um, I'm also very... Um, always connecting people. I love connecting people. So one of my friends said to me a few years ago, you're like LinkedIn before LinkedIn. Um, So I I love bringing my various friends who have nothing to do with one another and pushing them together. And uh, actually, Allison, I think I uh, introduced you to Amandine. So (laughs) yeah, we Um, actually wouldn't be here right now. Was it not for (laughs) Margaret and that connection? So thank you. So, and and I also think um, community is very important. I think um, what we do is about creating community. I come from a very small town outside of London, Ontario, where community is very important. Um, and for me, um, very much is whatever we're doing is about creating community and create, creating connections. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, so um, my sort of, passion and excitement about music in high school and playing in some bands in high school led me to pursue an undergrad in that had some recording arts kind of elements to it anyways. So I went to uh, Ryerson or I'll call it X University, maybe from now on, um, radio and television arts program, which is where I now teach as a contract lecturer. It's now called RTA School of Media. Um, and yeah, I focused in on the audio stream, you know, like Annalise, I, I was one of a handful of uh, women in the class. Um, and, you know, I, I learned a lot. I'd say the most important sort of practical thing I learned from my undergrad degree would have been signal flow. And I'm not just saying this because it's the title of the conference. I think it's appropriate. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just just how signal flow works. And I think once I sort of first wrapped my head around how that all works and the different just just that pathway and it sort of helped me get to a place where I feel like I can move from studio to studio location to location and understand how to set up a session and understand how to troubleshoot um, technical issues and so I said I would say that was really really valuable Um, one thing I feel like I wish I got more from in my undergrad would have been the the communication studio dynamics working with other people aspect I feel like you know, that some other people on the panel mentioned that they did get. I feel like that's something I was lacking at that time. And so was a little bit kind of fumbling my way through those dynamics as I started working kind of as a freelance producer and engineer. Um, so, yeah, there's that. And I also I did my master's degree at McMaster University in communication and new media. And um, part of my research project there was organizing a workshop for women uh, trans non-binary participants called Resampled. Um, and I guess through that, um, and speaking to you know what Margaret was just saying as well, uh, really learning the importance of building a community in this field. And um, also speaking of connections, that's how I first met Annalise. I didn't know really any other women at that time doing that kind of work and was introduced to Annalise through some other um, mutual friends. Um, and, you know, we're still like, you know, colleagues at times, good friends. And uh, it's been such an important, you know, uh, developing relationships like that with other people and other women in particular has been a huge thing for me. So community building would be a big kind of, uh, yeah, takeaway from the work I did at that time at McMaster. So. 
That's so lovely. And just gets to the point that even within the, in our own, I guess, room in Zoom, we have all of these connections and intricacies that really are so significant in terms of, of restructuring the in industry and thinking about um, how, how we pave it moving forward, the type of, of engineers and producers and recordists that we want to become and the environments we want to work in. Love this very much. Um, so the next question is to focus, I want to focus a bit on mentorship. So I know not all of you had access um, or had specific mentors or role models when you were coming up as recordists or in your field. So I wonder, I was wondering if those of you who did could speak to um, obviously their role in, in your early upbringing, but also the impact of that type of modeling or relationship at a young, younger point in your career. And this one I'll open to anyone because I know not everyone had specific mentors or role models that they they could recount when we met? Uh, I had some pretty good mentors. I feel like uh, one thing that has been really important for me with, uh, so I, I have sort of two, two um, people in Montreal and then I guess, um, but I think one thing that's been really, really important is uh, was making that jump from, from working um, DIY shows where no one was getting paid all volunteer run to starting to get hired um, in a professional capacity and like having people who will sort of walk you through that process and like what the expectations are and also provide those opportunities. Um, I've had uh, one mentor in particular who was very, very active about like seeking out opportunities for me to work in live sound. And, um, and that made a really, really big difference in terms of like what that trajectory looked like for me. Um, so, I would say that that's one very key thing, I think, is like that, that just like literally helping with the job hunt and, and sort of uh, vouching for a person aspect. Um, it's pretty huge, but also like giving you the space to fail, but not to fail so hard that it really impacts you very, very negatively. So I, I, I'd say that those are two, two things that I would identify. Yeah, I love that discussion of a place to fail because so often too, when people are tokenized within a space or a field, um, you don't have that opportunity and that's part of education, that's part of growth and learning. Um, so that's so critical, I think, especially coming up. I remember talking to many people who said, I had to be like more than perfect every single time. I had to be on every single time that I stepped behind the desk or in the studio. Even before I stepped in the studio, I had to know that, that it would be flawless because any tiny little mistake would be catastrophic in my colleagues' eyes. So that is something I think that we maybe don't draw, pay so much attention to, but that's really significant in terms of, again, encouraging healthy flow. I don't know if that's the term we'll use, but maybe, um, or, or again, just blocking and restricting people right from the get-go in, in a powerful way. Is there anyone else that wants to talk about mentors or role models? Oh, hmm. um, I had quite a few really great ones. Um, not in school, but when I first started working, the very first job I got was, the first paid job I got was at a studio called Studio 306. And there was a woman there who managed it named Leanne and her husband was an engineer at Manta, which was a very big studio that's now defunct, um, that I worked at for nine years eventually. But in a world where the studio owner I needed to paint the outside of his house before I was allowed to sit in a session. <laughs> she was very motivated to see me move forward. And um, my job that I had after Studio 306 was because she was friends with the manager at a bigger studio and got me an interview there. And then subsequently from there, later on when Manta needed a new assistant engineer, she also um, put my name forward in that pile. Um, which was very, very lucky for me. I mean, obviously you have to be good at what you do or at least trying really hard to put in the work. Um, once I was at Manta, that was a very big studio. Uh, it's where they did Tears Are Not Enough and a lot of Anne Murray records. And um, would I would say it was the biggest studio in Toronto at that time, um, as far as floor space goes. And there's a great hierarchy of engineering staff there. Um, so when you're new, you're on the very bottom rung 
and you have to know your place a little bit. Um, and very early in my career, a freelance engineer was coming up from Los Angeles to produce an engineer Blue Rodeo record. And he wanted to mix it during Christmas and New Year's and no one wanted to do it. So I volunteered to do it and they let me because no one else wanted to do it. And because of that relationship, um, that engineer whose name is John Wynott um, essentially just took me with him every time he was up to do work. He, he used me, he always requested me on his sessions when it should have been someone higher up. And also at Manta, they were very purist engineers. Um, and then John Wynott comes in and his mixes are squashed <laughs> so hard, so aggressively. Things that, that were based on using technology to create sounds versus being clinical and clean. Um, and so I would say that he was a really great mentor for me. And there were a few other engineers like that that, that sort of took me along with them, but he would be the one I would call out for sure. Anyone else? I, I think, I, I think um, for those of you um, working in universities, for me, one of my um, greatest mentors was um, my professor on communications policy from, from York, but I became a consultant who worked with him for 11 years and um, Paul Audley, and um, we worked on 15 copyright board cases setting rates for royalties. And, and it was him and um, Brian Robertson, he was at um, what is now Music Canada in the beginning. And what was great about both of them is um, there was no hierarchy in the offices. There was very much allowing us to um, sit in and offer opinions really early in our careers, which I think is very rare and, and was a great opportunity. Yeah, that's just such an important thing to note is that sometimes just being given um, the opportunity to step up in whatever way, in whatever capacity, technically, or just with literally within the room is what's needed just to, to make you feel and make you see yourself within that space. Well, and, and just always realizing you can speak up at any time, which, you know, in, in other situations, when I moved into a larger organization, and, and I always had an opinion, you know, you had to tone it down a little bit at some points, but um, because I was so used to that, I had a very fortunate situation in my first um, career um, positions where I was allowed to say whatever I wanted to say. So I, I think that is really important to try to find a place for that. Absolutely. So now we're gonna move on to talk a little bit about early, early challenges. So what are some of the main challenges you experienced and or some of the challenges um, you witnessed other emerging recordists experience as they're coming up? And of course this can pertain to any facet, right? This is, um, this is a panel obviously on gender and music production, but that is not necessarily what was most pressing as you were coming up in your career. So if anyone would like to start, Otherwise, I'm sorry, Amandine, I'm going to put you, I'm just doing the, the left to right here, like I'm reading a book. Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to my, your mind when you ask the question, I would say it was financially, really. Uh, it was definitely the main problem that I faced. Um, and I think when I left the business as a freelancer and I became full academy, academy I think it was due to financial, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, it, there's a link between that and the gender issues, but but when I was very young, I, I had to do all sorts of jobs at the same time, as I guess it was the case for a lot of people. It was not the case for all of my classmates, for example. Some had parents or whatever they could, you know, I mean, they could kind of get in the industry smoother or whatever, but I, do, I did a lot of internships. None of them were paid. Um, so I was doing that and I had to continue doing all sorts of other jobs at the same time, which was, yeah, I, I don't know. I would say that was the main, the main issue until I was older and I realized that I also had issues to process all the stuff that was going on. But when I was younger, I had no awareness of that really, yeah. 
I guess um, it's difficult to learn how to ask for how much money you your time is actually worth. I'd say that that was something that took me a really long time to learn and is still obviously an unfolding item. But um, but I think I think that that was something that I found really difficult early on um, and also figuring out like how to put together a contract that works. Um, um, I think of other early early challenges. I mean, it like just to like very much before I started working professionally, um, like when we were still just running this DIY space, like this group of friends, I, I feel like there was one issue, which was just that it was really difficult to get the guys to leave the board alone. So if I could, <laughs> could, could learn there. Um, but, but I think that that's sort of a far, far in the past type of challenge and hopefully not so much that something that people are dealing with now. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I can recall an early challenge, which is probably early to mid career challenge. Um, and that, and this may also be gendered, but I was brought up to not show failure. Some people are brought up to know that, that they, failure is part of the learning process. Like if they don't do it, they do it again, but they can do that publicly or in a class setting or whatever. And I was not brought up like that. I was brought up to not show weakness. So if you didn't grasp something right away, then I felt kind of screwed because I didn't want to show weakness in a classroom, in a job. And then you would have to get it through a back door, through, through a, a colleague that you trusted, was friends with, whatnot. Um, and so it took me a good, probably until I was from 18 to 24 to figure out that, that people actually will like me better if I ask questions and, and confirm knowledge and confirm things that I need to do in my job and will trust me more if I do that. Um, so that would, I'd say would be an early challenge and, and one that I say that it might be a little bit gendered because I feel like as a generalization, boys are taught to just keep doing something until they learn how to do it. Whereas that isn't always the case with women or girls when they're younger. Um, but that's probably a whole other panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a really great article by a feminist science and technology stutter, studies scholar that's called Boys and Their Toys. And it looks at the development of the Ford card construction competition that used to happen in the US. It's great. If anyone wants to read it, let me know and I'll send it to you. But yeah, that's definitely something that I think about a lot too. And that came up repeatedly when I was doing my dissertation work. Marcella, do you have a challenge? I think something similar to what Kai said. The the negotiating, uh, the um, not knowing how much to charge, and at the same time, kind of doubting how much you're worth. You know, um, being afraid of maybe I'm asking too much, but knowing that that's probably how much I should charge. Um, I think. Yeah, being insecure about, you know, having a fee and, you know, stating that fee and not being afraid of that. Um, I think that some, that was something that I struggled with starting out. Um, and also, you know, being offered compensation that I knew, you know, was not worth my time, but also not, you know, stating that's that's offensive <laughs> um and honestly still happens now uh you know um recently someone offered a dinner as compensation for <laughs> for so what did you do and uh, a dinner and uh, uh, ridiculous yeah. you know um so imagine still happens knowing that Knowing my my background, being yeah. being offered at dinner is is offensive. So it still happens, yeah. Um, just as a sidebar before we get to uh, Heather and Margaret, something I recently learned, which is hilarious because I'm older, is that the way that I get around that when it still happens now, is that I will give make someone a quote with two 
columns and one is the value and one is the discounted rate. So even if they want a discounted rate, they always see what value that I value myself at so that they know if they want me to do audio post and they have a $3,000 budget, but if I actually total up the hours of my work and that's a $15,000 budget, I want them to see that. And mm -hmm. then that way you can still make the choice to take that discounted work or not, but at least they know what they're getting like from you. That Anyway, that's my little mm -hmm. tip is always. <laughs> like that one. Yeah, that's so important. I think I had many people say that when they were getting started, they didn't even know what to put their rates at because no one talked about it openly or in their classrooms. Um, so that's something that I think there needs to be a conversation around in order for people to, again, be sustained in the sense of just having or being financially viable, being able to survive in a city like Toronto or Edmonton or Lethbridge. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Heather and I talk about this all the time, and I'm so grateful to have her in my immediate community of, of stuff because we can literally call each other up and go, they want me to do this. And this is how much money they have. So we can talk freely about money. But I, anyone I've ever worked with from student to my level of experience, I will always gratefully tell them honestly where, like what I make, where I think they should put their price point. Because otherwise, how do we know, right? Mm -hmm. And especially in a world where I came up finding out that me and someone that I referred to the same job and were both engineers in the same company when I left, I learned that he and he was making more money than me, and I was the engineer that was on top of it. So since then, I will freely talk to anyone about where I think they should be making mm -hmm. money. Anyway, sorry, Heather, you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm glad we've had these conversations because I've since updated the way that I send off invoices and quotes, thanks to Annalise's tip there. I find it really helpful for sure. Um, I definitely share a lot of the same challenges that all you have in terms of, you know, like f failure and dealing with failure and, and feeling okay about it. And uh, yeah, definitely the financial stuff. I've had men getting paid more for me when I've trained them on the job as well. Um, so all of that stuff. And then just like the, the overall kind of feeling of like, do I belong in this space? And I have like one sort of really potent memory that kind of like encapsulates how that's felt for me on a number of different occasions. But um, so currently I'm a mastering engineer as my kind of primary job. But before I got here, I did a lot of like music production and engineering and I was kind of been all over the map a little bit. Um, but part of the reason I think it took me a long time to settle into being a mastering engineer is the first time that I was ever in a mastering studio, which was, you know, I was in my early 20s. I was doing my undergrad and finished a project with a group and we were going to get it mastered. And I was super excited to be in a mastering studio because I heard about what it was, but didn't know anything about it, but super excited about audio. And I'm in the audio stream at school. Um, so I was like, I'm going to go and sit in as well. So uh, a couple of the guys in my group and myself went and sat in uh, this very still prominent mastering studio and mastering engineer in, in Toronto. And he started working on our stuff. Um, and then at one point he sort of paused on the work and he came and he sat down with me and he started explaining this study he read about um, how, how uh, being technically inclined is a gendered thing. So there was a study about, you know, a bunch of little boys and little girls, an object was put in front of them and they were studied and how boys are naturally inclined to take an object apart and see how it works. And the girls were inclined to admire the aesthetics of it. Um, and I just started getting really flustered. And I'm like, that's, you know, that's so essentialist. You're not talking about socialization at all. And he was just very firm. And he's like, nope, this is a study. It's been proven, blah, blah, blah. And I just was, I was getting more and more worked up. And then at one point I was like, okay, so right now I'm your client and I'm paying you money for you to explain to me that I don't belong in this room right now. When I came specifically to like understand how mastering works, to understand the ins and ins and outs of it and to like get that experience. And it just was like this moment of being like, I don't belong here and I can't do this work. And, 
you know, it didn't it didn't knock me down far enough that I never went in a studio again. I kept going in a studio, but it knocked me down far enough that I was like, I can never be a mastering engineer. And so it took a really kind of like long time to be like, I can I can actually do this and a lot of like work and labor to get to this point. But um, I'd say that that just feeling of confidence that I'm, I belong here, that I'm allowed to do this work has been the biggest struggle for me over time. And that's such an important example, I think, because it illustrates how perhaps he didn't even think that that was going to be a deterrent for you or be something that would be even offensive. He was like, let's communicate. I read something. So let me tell you about it. You know, it could have been harmless. It could have been very purposefully, you know, intentionally kind of a little fork in the side. Um, but it's important to note that a lot of these things that come up too are also just completely caught unaware, uh, just a lack of awareness of what's actually coming and bubbling out of their mouth. Um, so that is also something that needs to be contended with, especially early on in your career as a recordist, which I think is useful both for people who, who are often faced with kind of navigating that that situation but also those who are who are speaking and interacting and engaging with others in recording contexts. so yes very important thank you heather margaret um i think the most challenging time for me during my career was with two small children um and uh, changing from what is a very um you know non nine to five job um in music um, to having small children have to be picked up at daycare. Um, I um, got actively involved in my children's daycare because I'm a consummate volunteer. I just volunteer everywhere. Um, but I also want to know what was going on. And, and a lot of the problems then just still haven't been addressed. We still need a national child care strategy in Canada. And I urge all of you to look at what Maya Roy is doing at the YWCA in her um, feminist recovery strategy that she had out of COVID and into the election. Um, elder care and daycare um, is a national wide program across many sectors, but I do believe that for the arts and the creative sectors, it's even more important because sometimes we have salaries and, and, and remuneration that's too low. Um, and that is a challenge, but it would be offset if we had a proper um, child care strategy. So for me, that was my hardest time. And I had a fairly fortunate situation where I had a very um, supporting partner. And um, I worked um, for, uh, in a mostly woman led um, business at that time. And um, we worked all kinds of crazy shifts at different times from different locations before COVID. Um, but not everybody gets that opportunity. And um, I still think it's one of the number one issues for the creative sector. That such a great one of childcare for sure, because I intentionally didn't have a family because it would throw my career off. And the other women that worked with me at Manta all eventually left because they- Yeah, weren't. I've seen so many young women from the music industry leave because they're expected to be at daycare to pick, do pickups at five or they can't afford to Especially pay for daycare. Sort of the bravado of, of a recording studios where it's a, showing a sign of weakness to go be a mom, you know, a little bit. Yeah. One note to that, uh, one of the people who has been a really active mentor to me, uh, uh, Radwan Mumne from Hotel de Tango, has a funny thing where he he goes every day, like at five, he goes to take care of his kids and pick them up from school. And I think that that's also something that should be more normalized for male engineers as well. Exactly. Um, yeah. And it's like, okay, like that's, that's I mean, a great point. Yeah, he's just done at five and that's, and that's that. And it's been one of the odd benefits of COVID because people have mixed their lives a little differently. And so um, it may be something that hopefully stays. Yeah. Yeah. Hope so. I mean, I think that he was doing that before, but, um, but it's just, yeah, I hope that that stays. Yeah, that's such an important um, thing, I think, for the emerging recordists and students in the room to recognize um, this is all very possible, right? Um, Childcare should not be exceptional, especially for the precarious work that is still very much um, integral to working as recordists, as we've already heard by this point. Um, so that's something that even from this point, you can petition 
as Margaret mentioned, you can apply for, you can, you can really push. Um, Cause again, you shouldn't be limited in your capacity to live your life however you want um, because you want to have a family, right? Um, hopefully, you know, that's the ideal. That's what we're working towards. Um, so yeah, that's, that's so, so important. Thank you, Margaret, for bringing that up. Um, so before we move um, on to looking at more of the pedagogy part of our discussion, I just want um, to take a moment perhaps to address the students in the room and to give them your recommendations for either um, dealing with discrimination and harassment in the workplace, or if you see it, what should they do? Because I think this is something too that we're constantly creating, constantly informing in our own actions. Um, and this is really, we often think of this as women's work, quote unquote, right? Gender is women's work. Um, however, it takes everyone to start changing the culture and changing the normal behaviors and patterns and, and so on of certain spaces. So I was wondering if you would all be willing to speak to some of the ways you found helpful um, and constructive to deal with discrimination within your field um, for, for younger students that maybe don't have the power and authority that you as panelists have right now. My advice would be to be very aware about what you tolerate and what you accept. And those are two different things, right? Um, you know, when just beginning with jokes, inappropriate jokes that are offensive. Um, are you laughing? You know, that you're already accepting what was said. Um, are you laughing because you don't know what to say? also, uh, because that could be a reaction that people have out of nervousness or not no awkwardness. And thinking about being aware of who is in the room all the time, right? So that's the number one thing, just being aware of who is in the room, who you are, what you believe in, and stand by that, you know, also being open-minded. Some people come from backgrounds, families where, you know, they were taught a very narrow view of the world. But if you are at school and you have the opportunity to meet people, to socialize and to learn, you're here to learn. So being open-minded is crucial to, to the development of our society and the way that we see things and what we uh, are working towards. Um, so I think, yeah, you know, being mindful of what you're accepting uh, in your environment at the workplace with your group of friends and also being able to also speak up in a way that, you know, resonates with people, being able to be respectful and being able to say what you need to say in a way that can be perceived as, okay, I get your point, you know? I feel like we don't always, yeah, sometimes things are very upsetting, but we don't always have to be aggressive uh, but being able to to communicate with people and also, if you're in a position where, you know, you feel like you don't have to teach someone something, you don't have to, you know, as a person of color, um, as someone that comes from, you know, I'm from Colombia, so coming from a third world country, uh, being a young woman, I feel that, you know, sometimes I don't have to educate you, you, know, you should go home and read. <laughs> so there are situations where, you know what, I'm like, no, I don't have to do that. It's not my job. Uh, but when I feel like it's a space, a learning space where, you know, I'm, I genuinely want to share where I feel safe to share my experiences, uh, do so, you know, but also do analyze where you are and who you're with and if it's worth your time. Uh, so those are the things that I do. But I guess mostly be open-minded, be willing to learn, be willing to listen to people, understand who's in the room and be careful, be careful with what you say um, and what you, you accept. That's my advice. Thank you. Yeah, I think protecting your energy is really important. Mm -hmm. You know, knowing which battles you want to fight and, and when it's just not worth that emotional undertaking. Annalise? Oh, I said I have a really hard time with that protecting the energy. 
Um, yes. Like, for example, there is a, a Facebook gear page in Toronto. Heather will know what I'm talking about, um, which is not always a safe space for anyone that is not male. And sometimes when um, the comments on a post start being really offensive and I'm losing my crap and um, I feel like sometimes I still, and this is a whole other discussion too, I still don't want to, I still feel like if I call someone out very loudly, it will affect my work. So that is something I need to work on still. I think that is that is my age also showing because that was how it was for my most of my career. But I will literally get on the phone and call all of my white male friends who are on that group and say, you need to get on this thing and stick up for me because if I do it, I, and this is explicit language, but if I do it, the comments are going to be shut up you bitch you know what i mean they're not they're not going to be helpful comments and i'm not going to get the point across anyways you know what i mean so i i really have to if you are in the group of people that is not being offended it is better that it is your job to stick up for the people so that all the other i call the guys that everyone loves and respects and make them call it out because they aren't going to get the pushback that I'm going to get. So that would be, even though that's not, the, I should be able to have the pushback myself, but it doesn't always happen that way. So I do one way to get around it is to find your other well-respected friends that are within the group that is demographically the bullying group and have them call out the behavior. I totally agree with that. I think like finding your allies and then like keeping them close a little bit is very effective. Yeah, and I mean the the people that I call are people that respect what I do and yeah. and know who I am. Yeah. Don't you know who I am? Uh, <laughs> you know who I am, and and will gladly go to bat for it because yeah. mm -hmm. you know they yeah. know that I'm right. Yeah. you know, or whatever is mm -hmm. happening. No, exactly. Okay, I guess. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that's that's a difficult question for me because I, well, I quit the business being okay. I guess that doesn't work anymore for me. So now I'm going to be full time academia, and I swear that I'm going to do all I can so I make it better. So there are two things I can do: one is research, and one is education. Right. So I try to be on the on the front of both, kind of at the same level. Um, research has not been too bad. I think we got a fair amount of funding. We got publications. It's not always smooth, I can tell you, but things are going and there's more and more appreciation for this type of topic. And, and I think it's, it's kind of positive. Education has been very difficult for me. I'm not saying for everybody who's involved in that, but like I realized two years ago that even if I had the title of professor, I had no power to make things better for my own students, meaning that, yes, I can report issues. Yes, I can contact the students and talk to them about the problems. But if the institution doesn't help, then what can I do? And that has been extremely difficult. And as I'm in front of my students here, some of them are aware of all these issues. Pretty, I have played some difficult roles in those issues, too. Um, yeah, that has contributed to be like, I need to get out of this place and I need to work somewhere else. So because, yeah, I think it was harder for me to deal with that than deal with my own discrimination when I was at school. And um, so I would say, yes, students, you can do something better for your peers, but I hope also institutions get, uh, you know, better and to build on what uh, Annalise said, I wish, you know, um, my male colleagues uh, would have kind of said something, I would have helped with all these issues. And that was difficult to be the female professor trying to solve issues, you know, and being like fight, facing campus safety and my hierarchy, you know. So, so yeah, so I, I would say, yes, I mean, we have done a lot of things in classes, as you know, like a lot of uh, people have come to the class to speak and we that has been an open discussion, I hope. Um, and that part has been great because I saw changes. I mean, the AES student chapter 
demographics that is in front of us is very different than the one four years ago when I came in Lethbridge. So that has been positive. Um, one thing that I, I've, I could still say that would be a good thing to improve because I didn't manage to see a big change at the time I was there is that um, I would say more people who are not made marginalized uh, should be more conscious about trying to invite more of the people who are made marginalized in their project. And this is something I, I witness all the time not changing so much. And I hope, I, I wish that was different, meaning that it would still happen that I had the only female student of the class working alone for pretty much all her project or that kind of stuff. We changed that with the gender and music production uh, class because the demographics of the class was a bit more mixed, right? But definitely um, that's something you can all make as a change, right? And all be careful and, and remember that some people don't get invited to work on project. And that's that can be your call to be like, hey, what about you come and join? And, you know, so I think that is an easy thing to do that that can make a big mm -hmm. difference yeah. for mm -hmm. some of your peers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to to not even make it about gender, something that I have learned is you don't know where any one of you is going to end up. If they will be mm -hmm. your boss one day, if they will be the president of the Canadian Music Publishing one day, you have no idea where anyone will end up. So it's always in your best interest to, to sort of network with everyone, regardless of gender or race or any of those things. So yes, of course, do it, create room for the made mar marginalized people, but also you're probably helping yourself in working with a wider variety of people. Excellent, Heather. Um, yeah, I just, I guess, just adding a little bit to like the educational settings and, and being in the classroom. And um, I'd say one thing I try to think about from um, a teaching standpoint is to have dialogue about creating a safe space out in the open with students early on in like the first class typically. Um, and when something comes up that could be, and often it's accidental, but something that could come up uh, from a student's work that might be offensive to another student or something like that, making sure that those conversations and there's space for those conversations in the class. Um, and just, you know, treating it with as much respect and sensitivity as possible, of course. And my hope is that in doing that, and this has happened in the past, that students will then feel comfortable coming to me because and, and talking about if they feel uncomfortable with something else or, or, or dynamic in the room or something like that, so that I can kind of help problem solve and sort out the situation and make them feel a bit more comfortable in the classroom space. So yeah, that's just something I'm trying to be aware of on, on my end because I know it's not always safe you know we've we've already gone through this to confront the issue if you're in a professional setting and you're, it, you're it's not your place you could easily lose work or something but in a classroom setting I think it's so important to be able to have these discussions and so um, you know if you have a teacher that brings this stuff up and speaks openly with you about it to use them as a resource as well and to reach out to them privately if you're experiencing issues and make sure you get support uh, navigating and making sure you, you take up the space that you should have and you have a right to feel respected and um, good in your in your classroom. Um, so hopefully, you know, hopefully you all feel that in some way or, or at least know who you can go to if you don't to try to fix that. And there's always someone, I wanna emphasize this for the students, there's always people you can go to. And I mean, now you know seven of them. Mm -hmm. who will who will try their darndest to help if, if you need it so again there, there's always someone who likely has experienced something similar and wants to help and wants you to feel safe and supported within that space so I want to emphasize that um, Margaret yeah um, I think um, it's very important to be there for the people around you and speak up because it's too easy to walk away and and just go home. Um, but um, the one positive out what's happened in the last few years is there's been some great um, programs and resources coming forward. So um, the Cultural Human Resources Council um, put together a training program on anti-harassment that I believe is still available. Um, and I think that should be pulled into some educational institutions. We've been talking about that at the music level. Um, with um, there's a great organization called Advance that has 
come forward in the last 18 months to look at um, how to um, um, work with with young um, black students wanting to move into the music industry. Um, they've been running career fairs for the last two two weekends and there's all kinds of programming. Um, and um, I work with Working Culture and we've been running DI courses in different programs um, for small cultural and creative companies that may not have the resources to have an HR person on, on staff to um, provide the training that's needed. Amazing, thank you. I don't think I've heard about advanced work. Advanced yeah, Kezia Myers is the executive okay. director of Vance, a great new organization that has uh, emerged in the last 18 months. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so moving on to, to, to the end, closer to the end of our discussion and focusing more on pedagogy, I was wondering if you all would uh, take a moment to discuss your teaching philosophy or the goals of your specific program or audio education um, workshop that you've been developing and also consider perhaps in this discussion some of the challenges and I know Heather just mentioned one of the challenges uh, that she faces with some of her students so if you could mention that as well as just tell us more about your 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 programs and initiatives that would be great and we'll start um, with Annalise Bear with me because I have the least experience as a teacher. Than any Come other. on. No, no, it's true. It's true. I only uh, taught at Harris for a few years as their Pro Tools teacher. Um, and then otherwise, I participated as a teacher in, in Heather's um, resampled and um, also uh, did a few work, quite a few workshops for Canadian women in music. Um, and I would say that of all of the things I've done, I, the most problems I had were as a Pro Tools teacher at Harris, as a woman, I got some pushback, I'm pretty sure, um, from male students who didn't want to do the work. They'd go, I don't have to do it. I know how to do this. And I go, well, half of the, your grade is doing the actual work. <laughs> so, so you have to do it. And they would argue in class. One particular student would argue in class why he didn't have to do it. And I feel like that wouldn't have been a thing if, if I was a man. Um, as far as what the philosophy of, of what I enjoyed the most in my limited teaching was working for the Canadian women in music stuff, because basically the capacity in which I was teaching was that they had done a bunch of studies um, showing that the one of the number one problems for uh, women and trans people who were artists or musicians is that they didn't feel like they had a voice in the studio. Um, in that they didn't have the language to feel confident to express what they wanted to get from an engineer, a male engineer or a male producer, um, and then their voice is lost. So the work I did with them was essentially like fundamental, basic, this is a compressor, this is an EQ, this is signal path, this is how you record. Um, if you want this sound, these are the words that you use. These are the frequencies at which those sounds happen at so that they could at least have a voice and feel confident and not, again, to the thing about, as a generalization, women don't want to be imperfect. So they're not going to fumble around there. They're just going to shut, often will just shut down and not have the language. And then walk away from a session where they were the client, they don't get what they want. Um, so those kind of workshops were probably the most satisfying for me. And, and I would love to do more of that. Um, also, and it's not just about gender in that case too, it's that when you are not, and then you don't have a technical background, like you're a musician and you feel like you want to, you don't have the lingo regardless of gender because you've learned how to use Logic or GarageBand just by faking it and watching YouTube videos and figuring it out. You know what I mean? So, so you can get from point A to point B, but you have no idea what any of that stuff in between is. 
Um, so I love to fill in that blanks just because it feels really empowered, like I'm empowering people. And that that's always my favorite part of that kind of education. Brilliant. Thank you, Kai. Actually, I, I have uh, far less education experience, I think, also than everyone else here. Um, but I, I have been involved with this DIY space for a long time and done quite a bit of mentorship of people in that context, um, mostly just teaching people really, really basic, like how do you run a show with basic gear? And then what are these different objects that we have um, moving around? And um, I think one of the ways that I've started thinking about that uh, work is in terms of, um, of opportunities for gaining tacit knowledge. So this is a big part of what my, my thesis is about. Um, and so there are two ways to gain tacit knowledge. One is by doing something yourself. And then the other is by watching someone who's good at it do it themselves um, and hopefully getting to ask some questions. And um, so that's kind of been how I've been framing that kind of uh, sort of mutual teaching and learning work. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I feel like I found it really enjoy. It's really fun. Like, I mean, to work with someone and then you like show them how to do something. And then the next thing you know, they're the one running a show. And that's like a, a wonderful thing about, about um, sort of DIY music scenes um, is that it's very fluid and people can just try something out and see if they like it or not. Um, and uh, and it, we've wound up with quite a few very good engineers have, have sort of come from that space and, um, that's um, something to be really happy about. Um, but, yeah. I saw some head nodding um, when you were discussing that, the, the kind of joy in seeing that transference, which is lovely. Um, Marcella. Um, part of my teaching philosophy is to create a safe environment where my students feel free to learn, to ask questions, to speak up, to share their opinion, to try new things, to make mistakes. Um, just really a place where you're getting the most that you can from. Um, I want to create an environment where uh, you guys feel inspired and where you feel that you can be innovative. I think, um, I hope that the next generations of music producers and audio engineers is a generation of innovators. That's how I like to call it. You know, a generation of, of uh, people that want to develop new things, that have new ideas, that want to take what we have to the next level. Um, a generation that's not afraid to use technology that, you know, embraces um, all the tools that we have available to us, a generation that wants to create new tools, um, a generation that is not afraid to express um, through music or through technical skills or through both, um, through collaboration as well. Um, and a generation that embraces diversity and understands the value of representation. I feel like that's our mission statement, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I memorized that. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Uh, Amandine. Yeah, so I will build upon what has been said. I agree with everything that has been said really, really much. Um, but I will, I will maybe talk about three different type of things that are big in my teaching strategies nowadays. So the first thing is, well, when I teach workshops uh, to people who don't go to the schools, like the official schools, let's say. So I'm thinking of the program uh, Women in the Studio that Margaret uh, started, and also all the workshops I've been doing in Western Africa in the last few years. Um, I do feel that we absolutely need to teach more technical knowledge uh, to all these people because I think it does contribute to the, the really bad demographics at the end at the Grammy Awards and uh, at the Billboard charts, basically. Um, so there is something going on a little bit uh, on the internet right now when it's about talking about DDI in audio. It's like, and I've seen that coming from women and coming from people who are, have been male marginalized, but it's like, well, 
we can learn everything on the internet. You know, the only thing we need is business, business skills. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> like at the end of the day, you know, if you if your stuff doesn't sound good, it's not true that you will have the same chances to make an impact on the industry. So I do believe for those type of programs that the technical aspects needs to be strong. And uh, and also, um, you know, with, with a space, uh, safe space, obviously, because a lot of the people who have been marginalized don't feel secured with technology most of the time. So it's it's definitely a big thing to to address. And uh, in West Africa, it's it's a uh, you know it's very interesting because the level of the people I teach to uh, is extremely high when it comes to music, musicians, coaching, business, actually. But they definitely struggle to understand um, your signal flow to start with. Yeah. So that's for those type of programs. Now, when I teach in a university settings, it's a bit different because everybody gets access to those technical classes. So uh, one of the things that I, I decided to do when I got the job in Lovebridge is to do more uh, project-based situations with professional musicians who are uh, agreeing with a certain amount of constraints in terms of uh, how much the students can get involved uh, in those sessions. So, we did some artist residencies with people who came to record and to get the tracks, right? So they were, they, but the, the deal was that they didn't pay the studio, but they had to let music, uh, the students, you know, make mistakes and give their opinions, even if in a professional studio, that's something that you thought you should absolutely not do when you're the intern or whatever. So, and my idea with this was that to give students a different experience so that when they get in the professional domain, you know, they remember those moments and those positive, I would say, experiences. And so they don't feel it's absolutely normal to be treated like, you know, they should not have said anything to say, whatever. So I don't know how that works because, you know, we, we have no, no, we should discuss about that in a few <laughs> years. But, you know, I don't know how much, but but for sure we had fun. We had fun doing those residencies with the artists. I could tell that people were happy and I was happy too. And the artists were happy. Um, the third thing I want to mention is research. So that's where Kirk and I basically, um, I mean, it's not how we met. We met through Jordi, but another student connection. <laughs> but we, we basically got along on the idea that developing research programs or research um, events like Audio Plus is one of them and involving the students in the research as attendees, but also as presenters, as researchers. So we had a few people like yesterday, Leonard was um, presenting his new technology during the session and Max in the morning was uh, facilitating a round table. And today, this morning we had Jordi also facilitating, uh, presenting his research and participating in a round table. So, I think this has, has been um, very positive when I taught in Lovebridge. I want to do that more at York. Uh, and I think that is the key to change the, 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 the culture of our industry, basically. Um, because I think it's just awareness through literature, through doing, through testing, through interacting with different bodies of knowledge, different type of people, different experiences. I think that's where uh, we can teach people to basically get ownership and be empowered to make the world the way they want to make it, basically. So yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Margaret. I don't think I've explained uh, who we are. Um, we're the Trade Association for both the multinational and the independent music publishers in Canada. Um, what I find is music publishing is the best kept secret in the music industry. Um, a lot of people in the industry don't understand it, especially managers and labels. Um, but um, it is the home for songwriters, composers, and 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 music publishers. And my members, the music publishers, um, have allowed me to um, be able to um, set agendas that I think are important, and my members think are important for the industry. Um, so that's been mentorship programs for our members. A lot of one hundred and one on on music publishing, um, you know, copyright is my paycheck, is your paycheck. Um, if you don't understand where the royalties are coming from, um, you're not going to succeed as a songwriter um, and as a as a entrepreneur and as a, a music publisher. So I spend a lot of time, I've been on three different panels with students this week talking about that because I think we need to integrate that in because even in music business programs, um, in universities and colleges in Canada, you don't talk about music publishing. 
and it's it's uh, at least half of the revenues for the industry, music industry, and we need to get more information out there. We need to talk about metadata. Whoever it was was talking about metadata. The number one reason songwriters don't get paid and producers don't get paid is because of bad metadata, um, not because the tech companies don't want to pay, and which we also need to deal with. Um, <laughs> we've got a few interesting projects run right now. Um, we're in our third year of our Women in the Studio program, which has been referenced a few times here. And we've got Lisa Patterson in the audience who's in our first cohort. And um, Amadine was brought in uh, a year ago because people wanted to learn about mastering. And um, it was such a big hit that uh, I think you came in twice this year for, for the cohort and we've been able to grow grow the cohort. So um, it's not an educate a full educational um, degree or diploma, but it's meant for songwriter producers who want to move to the next stage of the career. They need to be move, uh, moving already. For some of them, is they've had technical training and they want to build a community to move to the next stage in the career. For some of them, they have only produced for themselves, but haven't been able to go into the studio and have anyone understand their their creative vision. Um, so they've taken that on. And for others, they're moving to the next stage of the career and they want to, um, um, uh, to Isabel Bennis from Cape Boy just opened up her own studio during COVID uh, in Montreal. And so, it, it, you know, there's various reasons for coming into our mentorship program, but what we're hoping to do is connect them for a great creative opportunities, great technical opportunities and great business skills opportunities. And we'll be um, launching our fourth cohort and hope all of you can be involved in that one <laughs> next year. But we don't stop there. We want to be looking at new forms of research. We're about to release. Um, we've been very proud to partner with the Indigenous Music Alliance to look at protocols on songwriting. Um, so if you are entering into a creative experience with an Indigenous writer or you are telling an Indigenous stories, I believe there's a lack of information about the questions you need to ask to have the permissions you need. So um, we're going to be releasing an Ontario Creates report with the Indigenous Music Alliance. It was a completely Indigenous-led um, process um, and with the um, great um, governance expert, Marcia Nickerson, who wrote the Imaginative Report for the film side. She's now doing that for the songwriting side. Um, we'll be producing training on that in March. <laughs> and we just found out, still secret, we're not supposed to be telling people, that we're going to be looking at the future of work in music publishing um, because we need to be looking at a more diverse workforce. But the skills that are needed um, to run a music publishing company in Canada is very different. Um, and, and so the tech and the data management um, to be able to translate billions of streams into micropayments for songwriters and composers. Um, so I'm really excited to launch that study to look at what we need to be able to innovate because for my indie music publishers, 80% of their revenue is coming from foreign sources. Um, and um, we need to be taking our songwriters and composers worldwide because you can no longer um, really innovate and succeed if you're just focusing on Canada. You need to be looking at the global side of things. So some fun stuff coming up. That's so exciting. Oh my goodness. I mean, and, and students, please take note. You, you have to register your work and make sure that your all of the documentation in terms of your participation in songwriting, um, in production, in engineering, and in performing is all accounted for because there, there are royalties there. Um, I know my partner who's been working in the industry for 15 years just realized two years ago that he could get performance royalties because he was like playing the little bass on all of his stuff. And he was like, oh, you know, I didn't know. He just didn't have the info. Um, so now he's like, yes, I am a bass player, you know, and is very excited about that, which is cute. Uh, but yeah, it's very important. So if you do have questions, please reach out and make sure that that you do have the, the information in order to, to ensure that part of your potential financial earnings are accounted for. Heather. Well, maybe I'll speak a little bit to Resampled and then a little bit to um, like my job at X University. 
Um, but yeah, with Resampled, this workshop, it was for women, trans, and non-binary folks. And the goal of the workshop was to break down some of the systemic barriers preventing um, women and you know trans and non-binary people from accessing audio the audio profession essentially so um one of the ways we tried to do that um is sort of you know touching on what like kai and amadeed said about the importance of technical training and so that was a big part of this workshop was to have hands-on training and sort of the idea of doing it yourself and watching someone who knows what they're doing do it as well which was an important feature so finding women working professionally you know such as annalise and watching her very confidently navigate a mixing desk and mixing setup and um, explain in detail and how important that is to see um, to be to to have opportunities to touch to see someone else touch and to also have someone who you can relate to in certain ways anyways be the one to show you that um, give you that experience so that was a big part of the kind of philosophy and pedagogy of the resampled workshops um that was you know and it felt important to keep it to uh like you know women trans non-binary folks at the time now it feels really important to make it these kinds of events very inclusive and you know not not make it as limited in, in my opinion and part of the reason for that also is just for the balance to shift i think it's really important actually for for men, um, students, students who are men, musicians who are men, to see women doing this work. Um, so, yeah, and so I do have an opportunity to work in that context through X University and teaching the classes there, which is great. Um, I'd say one of the philosophies or something that sort of changed my teaching philosophy a little bit or a way that I've adapted a bit was um, going through COVID year. And I, one of the courses I teach is an intermediate audio course and involves music production. And this was a remote year. And typically this is groups of students going together into a studio setting and working as a group with bands coming in. And now it's everyone working from home. So not everyone in intermediate audio necessarily even has a musical background so it's thinking how to support students some of who have no musical background some who have a lot of musical background working from home how, how to support them getting you know a studio basic studio setup getting you know signal flow in their own space um and what I sort of learned from this and what I felt like is, is necessary and it should be, in my opinion, part of um, academic approaches in general is to allow some sort of flexibility in course design, flexibility in its assignments as well. And to really sort of, I really had to meet students where they were at in order for students to stay engaged and to stay with the class, um, to sort of say, you know, everyone has to hit this marker way up here now get there when some people are starting from way down here and some people up here it's just not it's not going to work and especially in a remote context so i think it's more important to say if we can get everyone to learn this much whether it brings them up to here or here at this moment i think that's a good way to look at things and it might mean assignment results look different or it's you give them option in how they complete an assignment you know not necessarily going off writing a song and recording it but maybe it's about producing an experimental music piece where the process of learning, you know, the process of creating the piece is your learning experience and how valid that is and how it can really just kind of get someone engaged, a student engaged and um, wanting to come back. And, you know, eventually they'll get up to here, but first you have to meet them kind of where they're at. And I think, yeah, just offering a bit of flexibility and understanding in that approach is really important. And I found it was important in particular for that remote year and it's something I'll keep considering when I start teaching back in person as well so yeah that's so beautiful and so important I think however we go into the field or into classrooms is to think about all of the different levels that can be encompassed within that space so how do again do we meet the goal of learning right something something um, and yet make sure it's challenging enough for everyone and also evaluate people in ways that are constructive that are helpful and not just critical um, 
so yeah, that's, that's great. I'm actually taking notes for, for teaching next semester. I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to do in my pop music issues course. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs> I just have two bookend questions and then we're, we're pretty much done for the day. Um, so the first is specifically looking at what it takes or what you, you all would suggest it takes to be a professional recordist today. Um, and again, what does one need to know and do to sustainably succeed? I want to emphasize that again, and without burning out, without being exhausted, without dropping out, without having to compromise too much of themselves along the way. And so maybe we'll start back in the room again with Amandine. Hey. <laughs> well, um, I guess sort of the first question, it's easy for me to answer. I think it's listening skills, plus having good ears and, and a very broad, uh, broad idea. Okay. So I'm not just talking about technical ear training, uh, although that's important, but techni technical ear training for sure, but also critical listening and listening for diversity, listening for, you know, like knowing if a musician is tired just by the way they play or learning if, you know, your assistant is having a hard time, but the way they speak or any kind of thing like that. So listening, listening, listening. Um, I think everything else can be learned really on the spot. If, uh, yeah. Well, I don't have a magic solution. <laughs> um, I think one thing, and this is not just for women and gender non-conforming people, is that the recording industry has collapsed, as we all know. So there are still some jobs, but it's the, the typical studio engineer job is probably not the main, um, the main job that you can get after doing an audio program. Uh, there are tons of jobs though. And that's something I, I think with research is something that I try to, to teach the students is that there are tons of things that you can do with good audio skills and listening skills. And I think, uh, that's um, yeah, that's an important thing. So it's retention in a really broad way, not just as recordist. Um, I think they are yeah, the, the video games industry is developing, the three D audio area is absolutely developing, um, and you know a lot of you are doing that. I know, right? You're taking all sorts of classes. I had students being very successful doing video clips, right? And that takes to have good listening skills for sure. But anyway, so there are a lot, a lot of different things in the entertainment industry and in other type of industries that use audio. So I think it's, yeah, retention in a very large way. Um, yeah. Brilliant, Marcella. I think my answer to both questions is practice, practice, practice. Uh, I've told you guys are in my classes that, you know, recording, mixing, mastering, developing those skills, it's kind of like, you know, playing an instrument. You might know how to play chords, but if you don't practice that instrument, you're not going to sound good, right? Um, and so it goes with, with a ton of practice. Uh, if you know basically what, yeah, recording techniques, but if you're not in the recording instruments, listening, identifying which microphones do what, um, well, then you're not doing anything. So it's not about just showing up to class and doing the assignment, but it's putting in the extra work and practicing and adding up all of those hours to really get there and develop those skills. Lovely, Kai. Um, I would say sort of similarly to both both what both of uh, both of you said, uh, like just having a good work ethic and liking the work, I think is a big part of it is like being happy to do it um, because otherwise, why would you do it? Um, and yeah, I mean, I think also it is really like diversifying your portfolio a little bit, I think is a worthwhile thing to do just because, um, yeah, as Amandine said, like that that sort of recording studio job, it does still exist. Some people do still do that, but it's very, very unusual for people to, to succeed at making a living doing that. Um, and some of the big studios, like they, they're always closing and, and I feel like there's going to be, a, as well with the democ democratization of, of, of recording as, as sort of we've seen, like people record themselves at home and they need someone else to work on it. And that's 
problematic in all sorts of kinds of ways, but um, from a recording perspective, but it's also what people do. So, um, so yeah, I think being willing to, to, to find other kinds of things that engage your skills and do those things as well um, is, is probably a smart choice. Um, yeah. um, Brilliant. Then, oh, sorry. Listening, I, practice, diversify skills. Yeah. Uh, just in terms of retention also, I feel like um, there's something around just continuing to learn as you go that I think is really important because things are changing all the time in this field. Um, it's tiring. It's, yeah. yeah. I think also just developing a good social network of other people working in your same field makes a big difference. Like, I don't know. Otherwise, it's kind of a bummer. So, yeah. So, so yeah, to Kai's point, the flexibility of what you're willing to do is um, what has helped me through my career. I've been very lucky that I did come up in those big studio jobs, but um, then sort of with the collapse of all that stuff, you have to be able to do a lot of things. And sometimes part of that problem, and maybe this, I don't know about it on the education level, is just um, having some knowledge of those job opportunities that exist. Like we sit up here and say, there's no big studio jobs, but every commercial music house in Toronto would take an engineer at the drop of a hat. They don't want, they, they don't want to have to train you because they just, they're so hectic. So, but you can figure that out. You can find someone that to mentor you and help you get there. There's all sorts of these weird niche little audio engineering jobs that do exist and that you just don't know about. Like you don't know that that's an option for you. Um, and it might not be exactly what you wanted and what the dream was, but I think the sustainability is key, right? Like you have to find a place where you can make a living. And then from there, you have a place to jump off and do what you want and define who you are. So uh, a couple final thoughts. I'm not, I'm not uh, a technical person um, or a creative person. I am on the business side, but um, from my viewpoint, from what I've learned in the last few years is we need to do a lot of what we're doing today in terms of building community. I think there's some really good work going on. One of the programs that wasn't mentioned was the National Arts Center and uh, Heather Gibson, who's got the great producer program too. I think we all need to connect so that we're supporting each other's programs, which we've already been doing, but I think there's more work on that. <laughs> I think uh, we need to understand the importance of thinking globally. Um, and I think from the songwriting publishing side, that is something we already are doing. And, and so um, producers are needing to travel and if they're a producer songwriter, they need to be looking at K-pop and Denmark. And uh, we went to Denmark and had a song camp and a song from there immediately went to a K-pop um, uh, house because of the close connection between Denmark and Korea. So um, I think anyone going in and, and, and learning about the industry needs to understand the songwriting publishing side of things, especially in the pop world that is, is primarily global and so understand how their career could could function that way um and i think there's a piece that's adjacent to this but on the side um when you look at the usc annenberg numbers we didn't talk about them only 12 to 15 percent of the songwriters are women or are non-binary and i think there is still is a lot of discomfort for songwriters going into the studio um, who are women non-binary or gender non-conforming. And I think we need some micro um, accelerators to help make um, songwriters more comfortable when they go into the, to the studio. So I think there's, there's room there that doesn't completely have a full suite of um, mentorship opportunities right now. Absolutely. Cool. Heather. Yeah, I mean, I just really, really agree with what everyone else has said so far. I think that's all like spot on. And one one layer I'll add to it is just it's really easy to get burnt out in this kind of work as freelancers, especially when you're 
and you're doing diverse work because I think what Annalise said about diversifying is super important and um, there's kind of a, a constant if in the freelance world anyways which is what I've always done is a panic about when are things going to fall apart on me what happens if I say no to this and it's kind of this you know there's a lot to hold there so it's easy to take on too much and it's easy to burn out so finding strategies for taking care of your mental health um, so that you can come and be present with clients um, and whoever you're working with I think that's also a really important thing and something that I still really struggle with and something that I'm still trying to figure out for myself so starting that early on and making sure you're you're taking care of yourself through your work is is super important as well and in terms of sustainability I think like not being shy to reach out to people who you might be interested in having as a mentor um, I was not great at that so I sort of dodged the question about mentorship um, I wish I had a more <laughs> direct uh, mentor through you know, through all of this um, I think it would have been really helpful for me but I, th I encourage you know you all to reach out and try to find mentors they might not respond to you but you tried at least and that's fine and for you know people like us panelists and, and other people at this stage to be open to being a mentor for others um, you know share you know our knowledge is is a form of wealth and to be able to share wealth with others I think is important so um, if, if there's more of those sorts of relationships happening I think that also leads to more sustainability so can I that's, just um, butt in there too and just say on the mental health um, that's so important and um, everyone here who's entering the industry or in the industry you can join unison which is um, a really important um, um, voice um, there are um, free counseling um, you, you can join for free then there's free counseling there's emergency aid and there's a lot of um, really great things and for those who have the ability um, help us fundraise for unison because we want it to get bigger Mm -hmm. um, on that note, I want to thank our wonderful, brilliant panelists. This was such a pleasure and such a joy. Um, the last question you might be saying, you said you had two questions. I do have two questions, but this one's actually for the students in the room. So we'll get to it in a second. But first, I really want to thank you all for your contributions. Um, these types of discussions are just so incredibly valuable and enriching um, and fulfilling in a different way. So thank you, thank you, thank you, each one of you for your, for your participation and attendance. And I'm gonna give you a little clap emoji to show enthusiasm. <laughs> okay, and so the question I wanna ask the students in the room is specifically, what would you like to or love to learn about or learn more about or um, what would you like to have access to in your current educational situation? Because again, many of us are in positions where we can actually begin to make those changes that, that y'all are interested in. So um, I'm gonna leave it open. I know there's moderation in the room and also moderation in the chat, but please, please tell us. Hi, um, I think something that was I kind of never really thought about it before earlier this week because I've been very used to moving in um, music academic circles that were extremely male dominated and extremely like white male dominated. Um, something I would like to have access to is a more uh, racially and gender diverse faculty. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Everyone that I've interacted with so far at whatever institution I've been in has been wonderful, but it's Another one of those things where it's like just subconscious and it was kind of like hit me over the head. It's like, oh, never like seen someone that's like kind of like me or like looks like more like racially diverse or something like that be involved. But yeah, that's a big one that I would like access to. Yeah, brilliant. Modeling is so important. Thank you. Hi. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Um, I think that this has been super, super awesome. Um, the last few days I've learned a ton. Uh, I've already made a bunch of connections with people and uh, got a ton of new information that was super useful. Um, and it's great because I didn't know that there was another AES chapter outside of Lethbridge, to be honest. Um, yeah, we're the center of the universe. Watch out, world. Watch out. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm a little bit daft. But anyway, um, so no, this has been super awesome. Um, so thanks, obviously, everybody for setting it up. But I would love that we would do something like this again. Um, okay. Encourage other schools, yeah. 
It was awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have, I'll take one uh, question from the chat. Um, I'm constantly wondering about the myriad of potential audio engineering jobs other than being a studio engineer. I know there are many I can't even conceive of. Can anyone point out any resources for learning about these kind of jobs? Um, not even job posting necessarily, but just to open our eyes to potential careers. So I'm seeing Annalise nodding. This, was, this is what I always thought should have been like a little one hour class or a workshop class in education with that has to do with music production and audio engineering is is to make a list I actually and it may still happen so don't steal my ideas I'm joking um, but I always thought that it would be a great tv show to show opportunities different opportunities within um, audio and music that weren't like just like a show that would go one day you're going to learn about what a musicologist does and one day you're going to learn about working for uh the mounted police doing like cleaning up audio for it that they've recorded like uh, there's a whole bunch of things that you can mm -hmm. use that you don't know about and i always thought that that should be a class mm -hmm. in education if you guys want to add it to your <laughs> curriculum mm -hmm. hi oh, thank you tanya hi. hi how are you good how are you good thanks Oh, the clock. First day. So I've only known like five people here. <laughs> I'm Joy. Um, one thing that I would really like to see in the industry is a lot more like rule breaking and like understanding why the rules are in place and then choosing to break them for certain reasons, whether that's in the management style, in the mix, in the writing, like all that kind of stuff. And I think that one of the ways we can do that is just by being more open and having more like open discussions and conversations like this and accepting ideas from people in the studio instead of being, this is the way it's been done. So this is the way we're gonna record or this is the way we're gonna write. And there obviously is validity to industry standards. They exist for a reason, but um, I think it's becoming more of like a fluid space and like genre is becoming more fluid. Like a lot of albums I've listened to recently have like completely different styles of music throughout the whole thing. And I think that's kind of a product of being able to have these open conversations in the studio and in the writing process so more yeah, that's really important and really beautiful thank you for that and i think sometimes in talking about the technical we forget about the creative aspects but it's integral the imagination is integral you see sound you place sound um, you situate it within space it's like choreography um, so yeah there's a lot of room for play and experimentation which is important i think yeah, I love that. That's like art, like the, someone teaches you the fundamental and then and then from that you can break the rules and mm -hmm. find your own space. And I think that's the same in sound. In fact, um, I feel like sometimes there's records that I love, like there was one of the Vampire Weekend record came out, the one with Barchata on it. And I just remember thinking, these are kids in university making a record in their bedroom and it sounds better than most things I've heard. Mm -hmm. And it's like, either having a boundary or not knowing the rules and then mm -hmm. being able to just come out of that, I think is important. So yeah, that would be great in education. You learn how to do it mm -hmm. and then you learn how you don't ever have to do it that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. there's like Sylvia, because I think it's a Sylvia Massey book, Recording on Hinge, mm -hmm. oh, which, I haven't which is kind of fun. It's like sort of about that creative breaking of the rules. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really good. Very, very nice. Mm -hmm. It's a color book, so yeah. you can also pass your stress. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, we have another another question in the chat from Bo. What outcome models has this study considered for use as educational training aids in both the academic field and the public? Um, for example, classroom instructor tools that incorporate text, video, and audio for different forms and different materials of training. I'm assuming that's what that question is asking for. Yeah, that's so interesting. And again, as we see things like 3D audio and, and Dolby mixing and all kinds of new ways of doing the work, I think there's greater integration going forward. So that's a great point. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for putting on the show and it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, something I think would be great to see a bit more of would be a bit more collaboration with other fields. And I'm coming here to UBIC and seeing what the program here is like and talking to some of the students, uh, seeing how uh, like the music can interact with computer programming and electrical engineering. 
these are things that aren't explored very often, at least from my experience in the ULF. I'd love to see more of that or overlap with uh, video games, film and television, stuff like that. Feel some more cross collaboration into other fields would be exciting to see a bit more of. And we, we have a huge problem coming up is that Canadian game developers and app developers aren't using Canadian songs and composers. So multi multinationally, um, the big gaming companies are owned by some of the big record publishing companies and there's there's multinational songs going into those games. And now you're seeing a lot of listening being discovered and playlists on Spotify and Apple from that. But our Canadian companies are not using Canadian composers or Canadian songs. And that's a huge problem because the vast majority of the royalties for songwriters and producers are coming from television and cable right now and, and radio. And if we move away from that and we're not getting that synergy between the gaming and app developers and the Canadian song industry um, and composing industry, we've, you know, we're in a big problem in 10 years. So academically, if you all in, in universities can figure out how we can start um, training about licensing music, hiring composers and, and the synergy between those industries, we need it to be starting at that level. And I'd love to have that discussion with anybody who no. wants to have that discussion. Thank you. There we go. We're having the industry changing and reshaping conversations right now. And just to build on that quickly, because I think it's something I, I, I say to a lot of students when I do workshops nowadays, is that audio engineering is a field that tends to isolate itself, right? Like in a music department, even if there are more audio students than music students, it's almost like the audio thing doesn't exist. It's all about the music program. And it's the case also when there's media, new media, video, like... And I've witnessed that in all the schools I've been in as a student and in all the schools I've been teaching in. And, and building collaboration is not difficult as a one-on-one -on -one thing, but it's difficult as an entity thing. And I keep saying to people, we are part of the problem, okay? It's like we as audio engineers have to make an effort to be really understanding the other people's world and communicate what we do to them, which is the hard part, I think. Right? Communicate to people what we do, what we are good at, what, what our skills are about, why it has value. Okay, And so maybe the streaming company maybe will put our names where we make a record on the streaming platforms, right? So that we, those kind of things. But if we don't voice it and if we don't publish about it and tell people, it's not going to happen. So I think it's collaborating and also like keeping communicating what we do and why it's important, right? So it's something that I hope... Uh, the new generation will will make happen because my generation has not been very very good at this yeah and i think it's like an important part of keeping audio relevant as well as a field like rather than just sublimating it into these exactly, other things yeah. is that we build those connections in a very active way uh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Because every time they ha there has been collaboration, let's say, at you left, like it's, oh, they need an audio engineer for this project. Like, you know, could yeah. you give me free people? And then, yeah. but it's it's not really a collaboration. It's more like, oh, we need service. Can you guys do it? Yeah, and yeah. then child by. No, we need to build things that are equal on an equal level. And, you know, where everybody is valued. And it's, it's a challenge for our field. But I think it's what will change something, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, I say that, you know, when the recording industry collapses, when I decided to do my, my PhD on the topic, right? Because I, I could not believe that in all the newspaper stuff that was coming out, there were never a single audio engineer interviewed about it, right? Everybody was losing their job. And my professors will tell us they were losing their job, but it's never the stories we would be reading in a mainstream. Right. It was all about the musician situation and sometimes the labels and the business people, but the audio engineers were not really invited to the debate. But then I realized, well, it's also the audio engineers who didn't get them in, themselves in the debate. Right. So it's, it's important to to be mindful about that. Yeah. Hello. So I just want to thank you all for this. This has been absolutely amazing. First off, like as a first year student, like. I never thought I would be part of this sort of opportunity. And I was very glad that I kind of took this because I've learned so many things. But uh, one of the things that I want to suggest is that like in, in education, um, one of the things that is very lacking and uh, Annalise kind of touched on it was like talking about 
uh, the music industry or at least like audio industry. Uh, Cause uh, I feel like, especially for students is that they, they don't feel too confident in getting their music out there or out in the industry and, and such. And that that's kind of hindering a lot on their success as uh, you know, recording engineers, audio engineers, producers and such. Uh, and honestly, that could really help. Uh, another thing I wanted to touch on is like, um, that I, I'm, I'm part of the, the University of Lethbridge in the, the AES chapter there. And one of the things I noticed is that like, compared to all of the majors in like digital audio arts, uh, there's like a small fraction of those people are part of that chapter. And so I just want like, more people to become a part of it, especially like I noticed in my year is that there's a lot more like women who came into this major, which is really good. Uh, and, you know, getting them into this chapter could also reinforce their interest in this major. We want them um, here too. Yeah, <laughs> I, I want to do a lot of promotion. It's, it's, I have a lot of things to say about the AES. <laughs> we'll save that for later. Yeah, that, yeah, I feel that's... like women don't often do it because they don't see themselves represented there. And then if there's mostly just a bunch of, of, of as, as a generalization, white, straight males that are yeah. over 50, it's, and rightfully so, as in my keynote, I'll probably end up spewing a lot of angry comments about the AES and, and my experiences with them. But yeah, you're right. I think if you can, if you can, for whatever chapter, just rec recruit as many, as much diversity as you can into the AES, that is only going to help for sure. Yeah. yeah. yeah definitely. So, you know, when I arrived there, like four years ago, there was zero female there or non-binary people. And so I say, well, I'm not going to continue if I don't see women there. So they started bringing their girlfriends. There were these girls over there that didn't care at all about audio, but they were there. And it was like, oh, okay, you know, no, but, but yeah. But thank you. I'm very glad you took this opportunity. And I think also like with the AES chapter, like regardless of the issues with the AES organization in general, I feel like just if you can create like a space of, care and community in that chapter mm -hmm. like that's a great thing to do in a school context mm -hmm. and and will will only serve you well in the future right so mm -hmm. yeah i'd also like to really be looking into high schools and how we can be getting the messaging about the opportunities into high schools before people decide on career tracks so that we're attracting a more diverse um Group yeah, in, no, you, into I'm, programs. I'm not, um, it's uh, my son is just in first year engineering, and he came out of the first robotics program, um, it, which is in high schools all over North America, and it's very diverse, um, very um, lots of young women involved, and uh, it's um, it it draws them into the engineering field at that high school year while well, they're making decisions about career. And I think there's a lot of lack of information about music careers other than performing or being a manager or labor label. Um, nobody knows the technical or the yeah. songwriting opportunities and or composing opportunities. And, and there's, there's work we need to be doing there. Yeah, I don't know what that work is, but that's exactly right. And I bet we need to find 80% like of the students and people working in the field started as musicians and then one day had some sort of aha moment that yeah. this was actually yeah. a job and an education they could have, yeah. but but it, you stumble upon it. No one gave you yeah. that information. I feel like exactly, it was exactly that for me where I, I did these, I was like doing this whole other stream of stuff for like, like so many years and then like I remember taking music classes in undergrad and taking all these physics classes and being like, huh, I like physics. I like music. I like building things. <laughs> and like, no one was like, oh, you could do that. Like, it was yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm happy to work on that one with anyone. That This is one that I'd like to do and I haven't started it yet, but I, I you know, and there's Seeds Music Counts has done a track program um, for high school students so they can hear from professionals in the music industry about different tracks that they may not have thought uh, existed before they start applying to postgraduate or to um, universities and colleges. 
Brilliant. Any other questions? So I'm from Toronto and I was wondering, um, is to, to make it in the music industry, do I have to be in a big city? Uh-huh. Make it <laughs> meaning what as an engineer? As, as an engineer, I guess engineer, the musician, I guess composer. Good yeah. question. Composer, no. Composers now can work anywhere, but the, but the, everybody else. That composer opportunities come from 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 actually being able to network mm-hmm. in real life. Mm-hmm. Um, most people, what happens is you get forced into a bigger city, you make your connections, you have a start, and then you can move out of the city. But that's almost always the path, because that's where the labels exist, that's where the studios exist, and that's where places like Chorus Entertainment that hires me to write children's music exist. You know what I mean? Like, you go there, you build the connections, and then you can move out there. I, I don't know if anyone else argues that point. I agree that you you do need to be out there. Like and to, I, to make yeah. it, you could you could probably find a job anywhere and work. But if you want to do it at a higher level, I think you do have to find those opportunities, and they're usually in bigger cities. Okay, I I see. It. But I mean, not be for the your entire life. Once you have a strong network, you may be able to live somewhere else and commute. If yeah. you really want to live mm-hmm. in a small place, you yeah. prefer that style of life. That may be just a, a few years of really making things happen, and then you can. This is, in commute. fact, something Heather and I talked about all the time because we moved to this sort of a uh, tourist region in Ontario called Prince Edward County, which is very small. You're from there? Oh, amazing. <laughs> um, and we. Ha- make meetings with each other all the time about about building something there that is like a Nashville North where it can be a, a hub of production because we as the talent working at 11 at a, a certain level can try to bring it there you know what mm-hmm. I mean yeah. but but again both of us cut our teeth in Toronto I, I think right both yeah. of us so. Yeah. Oh, I mean, things are shifting a little bit. I think since COVID, there's been so many breakthroughs with remote production and collaborating across the globe, really. And the technology has changed. There's new, like, it's it's become a lot easier to collaborate remotely. But at the same time, like, how do you know those people that you're collaborating with from all over the world? Yeah, I mean... It's tricky. I feel like right now it is it is tricky, but I feel like maybe, maybe it's it's moving in that direction. So it's yeah, who knows what will happen in years time. But yeah, I mean, small like beacon of hope for maybe Alberta being a hub, potentially Cadence Weapon won Polaris Prize 2021. Mm-hmm. You know, Mercules is one of the top selling rappers in North America, Red Deer, Alberta. So did they I mean, make career not where are they from but did they make their career there like was their label there here? did they record all their records oh, there everything's did made they have here an deal? Yeah. Did they have a- Roly was in Montreal like uh, 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 King's Weapon was based in Montreal for a long time mm. Like I always, uh, the yeah. thing for me is like they go, oh, Justin Bieber, he's Canadian. It's like, he had a big, massive American deal. Yeah. He might be Canadian, but it has nothing to do with Canada, how his career broke, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I think the <laughs> BEM Center, if the BEM Center programs reopen, that's a place. I It, it got me started in New York, believe it or oh, not. Oh, yeah. Really? yeah, yeah, because the network I could do in one year there. It was so international and very high level. So many people have heard say that about Bath. I've never been there, but yeah, so many people have created whole yeah. networks based on their. Oh, maybe that's an opportunity to develop those kinds of networks through technology in the future. Um, Oscar Ivan says in the chat, which is, yeah, absolutely. And that's what we want to do with Audio Plus and uh, an idea of a journal. And, you know, so we try to also, yeah, kind of bring together people who are interested in in a different way of thinking about what we do and and build community basically yeah um can i uh, this is probably a good point to ask my question about this audio conference um the competition that i got to be a part of the adjudication for on wednesday was all male participants though that was put out to both schools, all students. 
And I'm just curious why you think that is that only male students submitted to it, because I was told that those were all the participants that submitted. Was it workload? Was it fear of rejection? Like, I'm just curious if there's anything about the gender that actually made that gender thing happen. Anyone have any thoughts on that as students or teachers? Yeah, I think um, I can't speak for everyone, but I can definitely speak for myself in that um, I don't have a huge background in mixing and recording. Um, and I personally, regardless of the fact that it was like a bit of a time constraint thing as well, like I didn't feel that like, I shouldn't say didn't, it's like I wouldn't feel comfortable submitting something to like that because just because of like it felt like the stakes were really high. What like, what are the stakes though? That that it's being judged in public by professionals? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, for sure. Um so, so I'm not a professional. No, I know. Uh, but but I mean even even the purest engineering students are still students, right? Yes. So 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 I that's my question. Is that a gender thing where where the non-male students don't feel, yeah, you go. I think it, it, I feel like it may have something to do with that thing of, of, of if you fail, if like, then you really fail if you're a woman, like, like that thing of like not having Yeah, space which, to, which is what my brain says yeah. it is, but I'm yeah. curious to hear from the, 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 the. A fourth year student, I'm just drowning. I really wanted to. And it's workload. But it's workload. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And then outside of. Um, school with extracurricular life, and then just family life. Um, yeah, I'm a single parent. Okay. Yeah. So it's just prioritizing. Yeah. 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 It's a great question, though, and it's kind of something that we, we have to follow up with the students on. It may be perhaps like a coordinated effort where it was embedded into coursework. Yeah. And in this way, it wouldn't be, I mean, it kind of goes in ways against what we were trying to do, but in ways that also would facilitate that activity. Yeah. And make it a bit. Like what I was saying, where, where there's, a, you know, there's a sense of something that really wasn't there, but you, know, you don't know that when you're, when it's not sort of been introduced, perhaps. Yeah, I just found it funny to, to come to a conference that, that has a, a focus on gender and then have the competition be all males, you know? We noticed so. it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one thing I could say, but I don't teach those students right now, but a lot of them I did teach before and Kirk did and Marcel, I teach them now. Uh, one thing I can say is again, at University of Lethbridge, you're seeing a different representation in terms of gender than what the school has basically, yeah. basically because I mean, last year I counted that I had four female majors, two trans women, I think, and one non-binary person and one trans man out of 70. Which so, is great. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> no. Not, no, it's not, no, 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 it's not. Seems, it's, seems better than the old times. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, you mentioned that at your time there, you were almost the only one, so yeah. And that's where well, we noticed it. We are like, oh, again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's an ongoing, totally ongoing thing. Oh, we have a great question in the chat. What's your opinion about getting a day job or a part-time job at the same time you were finding your way through the music industry? Would you recommend it? I'm asking it because I'm in the case of a lot of my audio students in my countries. I think there's nothing wrong with getting a day job like, uh, but I, I feel like also it's, uh, um, I guess it's important, like if audio really is your focus and what you really like to not lose that focus uh, by spending too much time. But it's really, I think a lot of people need to in the case of like, like maybe you're getting part-time work, but you're not getting full-time work. Um, yeah, this, is, this, is, this is also a, a, a problem especially in cities where, where you can't afford to not work or you can't, you don't have a family where you can still live with your parents mm -hmm. while you do internships or, mm -hmm. you know, work for free. Like I did, I was lucky enough to have parents who let me live at home. I mean, if you have to have a job part-time or full-time, you have to have a job. That's, that's what is happening in your life. Um, but the unfair part about it is that there's still an attitude in the real world of sort of cutting your teeth, paying your dues, where you're at the bottom of, of the hierarchy of people and you are putting in the most hours. 
So that that is sort of like the unfair disadvantage. If you don't have to work, put all your effort into trying to go down your career path for sure. I think like in the freelance world though, like having a part-time job could provide a certain amount of freedom. I think I brought up before the kind of constant battle of feeling like you have to say yes to everything because you never know when you might not get a work ever again. <laughs> it doesn't ever happen, but you always feel like it's gonna happen. So there can be a certain amount of, of freedom in saying, you know, I'm like working, even if it's a day a week and I have this base amount of income I can count on. And then I have these four other days to just take the projects I want to take. And maybe this is, a, you know, not necessarily when you're first starting out your career, you probably are going to want to take a lot of projects. But at a certain point, it can give you the freedom to say no at certain points and take care of your mental health because you have this set income that you know when you can rely upon. So, um, yeah, I think it could be a really positive thing for some people. I would just add to that that don't lose focus, though. If you do have to work you sh and you're going to school, school should be your priority. Um, so try not to lose focus on what your, your priorities are. Great. Thank you all for being here and for participating. And to the panelists, this was so, so rewarding and so fulfilling. And I hope it offered um, all of the students something useful as they begin to develop and grow and, and consider what their careers can potentially be. Take care. Yeah.